Good morning, everyone. I wanted to take a little time to talk about uh, our experience with uh, Lympha at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And uh, what I really wanted to do was to uh, give a little background in terms of our thought processes and algorithms um, and how they've changed, uh, both with this technique and some other advances that have occurred in our understanding of the axillary management of, uh, of breast cancer. So uh, I do have one disclosure. I am an advisor to a uh, company uh, that has nothing to do with this talk today, so there will be really no bias. Um, really, my talk will be uh, divided into three uh, brief areas. One, I, I want to talk about the update on axillary management. Uh, second, uh, describe our algorithm for lympha and how we've incorporated that into our practice for the betterment of our patients. And then third, some of the considerations uh, that we have to have, some new considerations as breast surgeons um, as we um, unfold this new, this new offering. So I'll just go back in history a little bit. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the NSABP B32 trials. Uh, this was actually performed by one of my former colleagues, um, uh, University of Vermont, prior to coming to uh, Beth Israel. This study looked at uh, over 5,000 women who were clinically node negative, and they were randomized to either undergoing a sentinel lymph node biopsy versus an axillary lymph node dissection. You have to remember at the time, uh, the standard treatment for all invasive cancer was to do a full axillary node dissection. So this was quite a, a radical dis departure uh, of understanding to think that, my gosh, you actually can leave lymph nodes behind with invasive breast cancer. So the randomized trial showed that after a medium follow-up of 95.6 months, there's no difference in overall survival or disease-free survival or regional control uh, between the two groups. And this really ushered in a new wave of our understanding and management of the axilla. And this transformation uh, from a very um, radical procedure with a complete uh, axillary node dissection as we see here, uh, to just doing a sentinel node biopsy. Um, with this came a significant decrease in complications, nerve injury, uh, lymphedema. Uh, but as was pointed out by my colleagues beforehand, uh, we didn't eliminate the, the rate of lymphedema. Right? We decreased it, but still lymphedema uh, was a problem. And we also still had cases where an actually no dissection was still necessary. This other trial that came out uh, also changed some of our understanding about the management of the lymph nodes. This was the ACOZOG uh, Z11 trial. Uh, in this trial, we looked at patients who had T1 to T2 uh, invasive cancers. Uh, patients had no palpable adenopathy, so these are clinically node-negative patients now, uh, who had one to two positive sentinel nodes. So now we're talking about this, um, this shift of thinking. So we've gone from everyone needs an actually node dissection to we can do a sentinel node biopsy, which is great. Uh, but the thinking was that if you had a positive sentinel node, uh, then by gosh, all the nodes need to be removed. They're all connected. There's violation in that area, so you need to remove the lymph nodes. And this study really challenged that. It said that if you had minimal disease limited to one or two sentinel lymph nodes, uh, these patients were randomized to the traditional therapy of astronaut dissection versus what was new at the time, um, observation. Now, importantly, all these patients had appropriate adjuvant um, therapy. They had uh, radiation therapy for the most part and, and chemotherapy. And what they found in this result was that if you looked at the um, survival curves, uh, there really was no difference. All right. So this goes back to the point that minimal disease in the axilla uh, does not require a complete actually no dissection. I think one of the speakers before talked about, you know, prevention is really the best way to prevent lymphedema. Um, this study showed that we can prevent lymphedema by not needing to do actually no dissection if there's a minimal uh, lymph node disease. And again, the five-year overall survival, disease to survival, local recurrence rates were really equivalent between the two groups. There was no significance. And this was really a radical change in our understanding. And uh, again, uh, I think one of the best ways that we can help to reduce the likelihood of lymphedema. Important to realize that there was an uh, exclusion criteria, so not everyone fits into this mode. Uh, if patients had three or more positive sentinel lymph nodes, the standard is still to recommend uh, axillary treatment. Um, if there's gross matted nodes on clinical exams, again, they weren't really considered appropriate for this trial. Uh, gross external disease. Uh, interestingly, if patients undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy were not included, so technically we don't have data uh, on that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some other uh, research that addressed that issue. And again, uh, the Z11 trial looked at patients undergoing lumpectomy and didn't explore patients going mastectomy. So technically speaking, these would all be exclusion criteria to the simple observation uh, arm. Speaking of new adjuvant therapy, there was another study, the ACOZOG uh, 1071 study, uh, that looked at women, uh, again, T0 to T4 disease. Uh, these patients had uh, clinically uh, lymph node involvement uh, and received new adjuvant chemotherapy. 
Um, what the question was here is that if you have chemotherapy before treatment, a lot of time that eradicates or downstages uh, the extent of disease. So someone coming in with palpable, clinically positive lymph nodes who would otherwise require lymph node dissection, uh, if they got a good response to chemotherapy, so for instance, if uh, I can no longer feel these positive lymph nodes, the question is, may they not be a candidate for central lymph node biopsy? Give them the benefit of the doubt to see if there's actually any disease left. We've been doing that for years in the breast. If a woman comes in with a large mass in the breast and she has chemotherapy up front and that mass decreases in size, I can now go from a mastectomy to a lumpectomy. So the thought is, can we do the same thing in the axilla, go from a node dissection to a central lymph node biopsy? And this study showed that it was feasible. Now, there was a cost. Uh, the false negative rate was a little bit higher, about 12.6%. Um, obviously, that has a little bit of concern that we might be missing disease. However, uh, what the study found is that if you're able to obtain at least three lymph nodes, three sentinel lymph nodes, and if you use dual tracer, which facilitates your ability to identify these lymph nodes, then your false negative rate drops down to 9.1%, which is actually in the realm of acceptability. We say anything less than 10% is acceptable. Um, similar results were found in another trial, kind of the Sentina trial. And again, this really opened up um, options for women with uh, palpable lymph nodes that, again, we don't have to have this knee-jerk reaction to do a node dissection. There are options, uh, for instance, giving chemotherapy and downstaging the axilla. Another study looked at another way of managing the, uh, the lymph nodes. Um, we talked about the astronaut dissection being the, uh, the main way of, of handling um, positive lymph nodes or a uh, high level lymph node burden. Uh, the AMROSE trial actually looked at an alternative, doing radiation instead of dissections. So this looked at uh, nearly 5,000 patients with T1 to T2 disease. Uh, these patients were clinically node negative, underwent uh, breast conserving surgery or mastectomy, and then at the time of surgery when a central lymph node biopsy was performed, uh, they were randomized to either having a axillary node dissection if the, if the lymph nodes were positive versus axillary radiation therapy. Okay. So what did this trial find? find? They found that after a median follow-up of 6.1 years, uh, the five-year actually recurrence rates between the two groups were about the same. Uh, the five-year disease-free survival rates were, again, equivalent, and the five-year overall survival was about the same between the two groups. So this was really exciting because it gave us another opportunity. So now if we had a patient with a positive sentinel lymph node that may not fit the Z11 trial where we could just observe them, we felt that you know, some treatment needed to be done, um, rather than doing an axillary node dissection, we had the option of providing radiation therapy with no detriments in terms of survival or local control. Interestingly though, uh, the one thing that was shown to be significant was that the rate of lymphedema was much uh, higher in the astral lymph node uh, dissection group. So this is something that should definitely weigh into our decisions in terms of how we manage this. The other thing to talk about was the rate of lymphedema in the radiation group. Although it was lower, again, it was not zero. Um, so we still had that problem. And I think this is where um, these prior trials now meet up with what we're talking about today with lympha. And I think lympha really does offer us a whole new uh, way of looking at the management of the axilla uh, and a different way to incorporate uh, treatments. So who needs a national lymph node dissection? So, you know, we talked about the Z11 saying that we can observe patients with minimal disease. We have the AMROSE trial that shows that we can uh, radiate instead of doing lymph node dissection. And we have uh, the 1071 trial showing that we can do neoagent therapy and convert positive to negative lymph nodes. So we have a lot of options other than doing a node dissection. So who still needs this procedure? Well, we still routinely provide this procedure for patients with inflammatory uh, breast cancer. So that would be a very high risk group. Um, Patients who have residual actually disease after new adjuvant chemotherapy, so we, we give the chemotherapy, we do the sentinel biopsy, and there's still positive disease, uh, we feel that those patients uh, require no dissection. Uh, patients with uh, gross disease who don't undergo new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy would be candidates for axe dissections. And any patient who has a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy who wasn't a candidate for Z11 uh, or uh, AMROS. Okay, so we still have a subgroup of patients who require this procedure, uh, and again, we have this risk of lymphedema. So with the lympha, we have something we can offer those patients so that we can treat them appropriately, uh, but decrease the likelihood of complications. Uh, and we have a very simple algorithm here at BIDMC. Uh, any patient who's prior to surgery identified as requiring a lymph node dissection, so just go back to that prior slide, anyone who fits this criteria, who I know up front is definitely going to have a node dissection, um, they'll have a preoperative consultation with uh, our plastic surgeon, and we'll plan a combined procedure where I can do the, the breast surgery to remove the cancer, uh, the required lymph node dissection uh, combined with the lympha procedure. So this takes some coordination. Uh, we've, been, we've really been able to incorporate this into our multidisciplinary uh, planning uh, so that patients can have this combined procedure at the same time. So this is for patients who we know uh, a priori will need this procedure. 
What's really changed is for patients who we find out after the fact require some lymph node, uh, an axillary lymph node dissection. So these are patients who, uh, based on intraoperative or postoperative findings, we make the decision that you know there was more than meets the eye or things didn't uh, regress as much as we thought, um, and this patient requires a lymph node dissection. So for example, a patient undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy, looks like they get a great response. Uh, I do the sentinel lymph node biopsy, and lo and behold, there's three or four positive uh, sentinel lymph nodes, or even one or two positive sentinel lymph nodes. This patient would require uh, a consideration for a node dissection. So what we do here is we actually, we no longer make that decision intraoperatively. So there was a time that we would do that, uh, but we would actually uh, postpone the lymph node dissection, not do, it, do that at the time of the initial breast surgery, send the patient for consultation with plastics, uh, and then have a later or subsequent combined procedure where we do the lymph node dissection with the lymph. So again, this is a little bit of a change uh, in terms of our workflow, uh, but it allows the patient to have the opportunity to have that lympha procedure uh, rather than having a, a lymph node dissection that would increase their likelihood for lymphedema. We have had uh, some consideration changes uh, based on this. Uh, and again, the one most notably, as I mentioned, uh, was no longer really making that interoperative decision uh, for actually lymph node dissection, which means that I don't send my central lymph nodes for frozen sections anymore, right? Because even if it's positive, I'm not going to make a decision to do the node dissection at that time. So I actually wait for the final pathology. I look at all my options. Could I treat this patient on Z11? Can I radiate this patient? Does the patient need an actual lymph node dissection? If so, we, can we do that with, uh, with a lympha? So I think that was the biggest change in terms of our workflow. Um, we have, in some cases, uh, due to the uh, generosity of our uh, plastic surgeon, Dr. Uh, Singal uh, uh, specifically, um, had plastics on standby for high-risk cases. So we have a patient who, uh, let's say, was clinically no positive, uh, had the uh, chemotherapy up front. Um, looks like maybe they had a good clinical response, but you might still find some fullness or maybe something on imaging. There's a high likelihood that intraoperatively there's going to be more disease. And I remember one of the first cases we did, Drew, this we, we had a young woman who initially looked like she had a good response, but when we got in there, it was clear to me that she had gross uh, adenopathy. I mean, I could palpate lar multiple large lymph nodes. So uh, we actually um, had Drew on standby uh, and, was, and were able to do the, the lympho when I, when I did the, the lymph node dissection. Uh, I think the two other things that uh, we need to consider as breast surgeons when incorporating this technique is understanding the importance of sparing or preserving uh, the veins and the axilla. Uh, a lot of times, um, you know, these veins are small and they could be tied off or clipped uh, with really no consequence. But if you're thinking about doing a lympha procedure, um, it's important to preserve those veins. So in terms of my technique, you know, obviously we always make sure not to injure the axillary vein or the thoracodorsal vein, but even these small little branches around there, and we're very cautious to preserve those veins now because they may be required for the lymphatic bypass. And we wouldn't want to be in a situation where we want to offer that to the patient, but because of the way that we did the surgery, that we sacrificed those veins and now we're, we're unable to do the procedure. And then the last thing I'll leave you with, I think uh, another area um, for consideration, this is more for the research point, is you know, all those studies that I uh, alluded to before uh, were performed prior to uh, the advent of lympha. Um, so I think this really is a time for us to relook at all these things and throw in yet another variable, and that is the actual lymphoma dissection versus lympha. And I think the biggest one, for instance, would be uh, looking at that uh, compared to actually radiation therapy and really seeing which one results in lower rates of, uh, of lymphedema. So not only has this been an excellent offering for our patients, uh, something that's changed our algorithms for how we approach the axilla, uh, but it really has um, uh, forced us to question our assumptions and to uh, look back at traditional research and see, um, in light of these new techniques, uh, how do we need to interpret these results. Uh, so with that, I thank you for your time and attention.